So, since today is Swami Vekananda's Mahasamadhi, he had said something very interesting once. He said that in the old thinking, the man who does not believe in God is the atheist, but I am telling you that the man who does not believe in himself is the atheist. So, he said this because in our culture, you see, our culture is a very ancient and very unusual and in many ways very peculiar culture. And this is not Hindu or Buddhist or Jain, I'm just saying ancient Indian culture. We have this very remarkable feature that is not found in any other culture. And that is, in the culture of India, man is much more important than the gods. Now I know, we are a religious country, we have 333 million formal gods, <laughs> we have temples everywhere, everybody is religious, everybody is constantly praying, making bargains, going to Tirupati, but at a very deep and fundamental level in yoga, and this is true across Buddhism, Hinduism and uh, Jainism, at a very deep level in the mystical and in the deep spiritual practices, the greatest blessing is to be born human. Now, the human body has certain limitations and it is a very huge limitation. Your skin is the limit of your physical potential. You can expand, you can contract, but not beyond a certain point. Your mind can expand to infinity. Your emotions can expand to infinity. Your prana or your internal energy can expand to infinity but human birth has the flaw or human birth has the limitation that your skin forms a boundary of potential now of course people claim miraculous stuff that they can levitate and they can you know, but those are even if true those are exceptions but that is not the point. If you really feel so bad, you can drop the body and go into an astral plane and work it out without the limitation of the body. Those planes have been well described. Paramahansa Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi, describes how people function. But the minute you go to an astral plane, you find one big problem kicks in. You don't have a body, you don't have the pain and suffering of the human birth, but your karma moves at an infinitesimally slow pace. So, whether good action or bad action, everything starts moving like a snail that has taken valium. <laughs> so, if you want to become enlightened and liberated, it is not that it does not happen on other planes of existence, but you have to come to the human birth. In fact, liberation is not possible anywhere else. You can even become enlightened on some other dimensions. According to yoga, there are 24 interlocking spheres of existence. There are 24 spheres of existence where there are beings, some of them like us, some of them not like us. And many of these so-called reports of alien encounters are actually people who for whatever reason slipped into that other dimension. Now it is not one sphere within the other. It is all simultaneously existing at just slightly different planes of vibration. And when you are deep in meditation or you advance that much, you can start accessing those other places. So the Devas and the Swarga or Amravati or whatever it is you wish to call it, and Naraka or Hell or whatever, those are all different planes of vibration. And they are all very wonderful, but the problem is karma does not move except on Mrityu Loka, which is what our, <laughs> our world is called. Mrityu Loka. Mrityu Loka. Because death happens here. You know, so... To be a god is not a very great thing in our culture. If you do enough good deeds, you get a promotion and then you get a job. It's a job designation. It's a title. You know, you can be an Indra. An Indra only means the leader or the best in that field or that sphere. Somebody else with greater qualifications, that means better karma comes along, that person can be fired and you get promoted to that job. So in our mythology there are multiple stories where people are doing tapasya and Indra gets scared or the gods get scared. Because gods do get deposed and people do get promoted or demoted or whatever. The gods also get tired. If you don't want to go to heaven, you want to be worshipped, you want to be loved, you can actually decide. 
I want to be a god sitting on a temple and people can come to me and praise me and make offerings to me. That also is perfectly possible. Because what we call gods, what we call devas, deva or devi literally means shine. They glow, they shine with the energy that they have created. They are energy beings or in the classification of Sri Aurobindo, they are vital beings. They are not human, but they are neither are they the last form or the highest attainment. They are in transition, they are in transition to the final form of divinity. So you can become one of them and you can sit in a mountain top somewhere and have pilgrims come and do puja and you know and then you get bored and then you say okay that's it I want out. If somebody is willing to take up that responsibility you get out then people complain. Nowadays we don't get that same feeling when we come to the temple. That's because the vital being sitting over there has quit <laughs> and there is a new person sitting there and the new person is still learning the job you know. So in many many so-called powerful places, the power that we are experiencing is not the power of the place, it is a vital being sitting there. Our psychic energy is drawn by that vital being and occasionally little bit is given. Even if you grant one in hundred the wish, reputation builds. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> No, I am just explaining how it works. In yoga, all these things are well known. In yoga, all these things are well known. They know very well that that's not really God. That's something that is aspiring to be God. That is a vital being that is aspiring to be God. It is not even a divinity. So to be a deva is really not regarded as a very worthy ambition. You know, To be a deva is not regarded as a very worthy ambition. And to be a vital being... The other problem with the vital being is most of them are quite nice, many of them are quite nasty. So those are the demonic or the asuric or the rakshasic or the... And they too are worshipped and they too give benefits and they too give... Now all that is not necessary to get into. The problem with worshipping vital beings is that beyond a point they don't want you to grow because their power depends on your worship. Now throughout history people have been worshipping gods. Were they all stupid? Were they all illiterate or were they all mistaken? If you are a Christian fundamentalist or a Muslim you would say yes. They were not stupid. They were worshipping vital beings, they were getting responses but today those gods are dead. You only have to go to Egypt or to Greece or to Rome and you can see those were vital beings who no longer have worshippers. Or Thor or Odin or you know any of the, the Celtic gods or any of the peculiar, peculiar gods that used to exist in the Middle East or you know, extreme East of Europe, they all had what they thought were supreme gods or powerful gods and the worship has stopped. In India, this thing, this story of worship has been going on for 5000 years so we have a deeper and stronger relationship. But the truth is, except for Shiva, who is something else altogether, maybe when I talk about Shiva, I'll talk about it. Except for Shiva, almost any other form of Devi Devta that we see is fundamentally a vital being. I am not saying they can't help you. I am not saying it is not good to worship. If you have ever read uh, David Foster Wallace, he had given this great commencement speech. It is called This is Water. And I suggest either you Google YouTube or you Google, just Google David Foster Wallace, This is Water. And he had said something very interesting there. He said, it is better that you worship a, a recognized form of divinity because everybody worships. If you don't worship a recognized form of divinity, you will end up worshipping things like the body, fame, money, power, success. And when, as they inevitably start dwindling mm -hmm. or leaving you, what he said is they eat you alive. So what you worship is very important because everybody worships. So the ultimate level of Godhead, when it is in a personal form, it is called the Purushottama, you know? the, the ultimate man, the Purushottama, Uttam, it's called the Purushottama and the abstract form of it, Sri Aurobindo called it the force, long before George Lucas called it the force, that is the, that is the power, the Shakti that acts, you know, and then there is a non-classifiable aspect. There is a, an aspect where words are insufficient and experiences are insufficient and that is called the Brahma. 
that is a that is no, no. the brahman brahman not brahma oh brahman yeah, that is called the brahman you know so that actually is the foundation of all the gods and the devis and the devtas and everything but the truth is according to our culture the gods don't run the universe the rishis run the universe <laughs> they are much more powerful than the devas they are much more strong than the devas they are much more and you see we are we are different in another way in that we don't have fear of our gods you know the nowadays of course people do say it i'm a very god fearing person but we have nine forms of bhakti nine forms of relating to god we can treat god as our parent we can worship as our mother father we can treat god as our child okay you know many of them they bala gopala bala rama they treat it like the baby you can treat it like a brother or a sister you can treat it as a friend you can even treat it as a spouse i don't recommend that for a spouse as a husband or a wife there is a lover yeah no as a husband or a wife there's so a lover is different let's one form of bhakti the lover is different from the spouse from the spouse you know so we have all these multiple ways of relating and in none of these ways fear comes into it you know so it is not a it is not a something that we are afraid of and there is something even more unique you see in almost all the other cultures which had gods the gods were very tyrannical yes you know and they were very capricious shakespeare and king lear has very famously said and i mean it's the best it's the two liner definition of human relationship as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods they kill us for their sport oh say that again as flies to wanton boys wanton means uh, irresponsible stupid as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods they kill us for their sport, sport. now our gods can't do that because the universal law that functions in india the, the law that holds the universe together there is only one law actually in the universe and that law is not gravity that law is karma all actions have consequence there is the law that is the law that holds the universe together and the gods are not exempt we are the only culture in the world the only culture in the world where a human being can turn around and curse a god <laughs> and the curse Will have an effect. That curse has an effect. We are the only culture, and that is something unbelievable. That is something extraordinary. Most other cultures are like what Christopher Hitchens has described as, you know, that your relationship with this God is like living in this totalitarian society where you have to obey the rules, you have to fear Him, and you have to love Him. No. <laughs> you know, and there is God the Father, and then there is. usually also one substitute for him either his son or a representative so there is a great leader and the dear leader he said like like living permanently in north korea <laughs> because the founder used to be called the great leader and the guy the guy who just died used to be called the dear leader you know so so he was like that's not the way to live and you see because man is important it is perfectly possible in india to be hugely spiritual and to be completely atheist 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 you don't have to believe in the gods you don't have to you don't have to in any way accept the notion of a divine creator or any such thing no there were multiple the charavakas were atheists the ajivikas seem to be atheists uh, buddhists and jains their notion is very much that the gods are not important in fact the hindus abandoned the vedic gods because they became so closely associated with the buddhist and the jain culture you know and that is why the hindus abandoned the vedic gods and then created all this vishnu and shiva and okay. durga and they created new mythologies that is another story for another day because they were uh, connected to buddhist too much too much too much, too much. The, all the vedic gods had become completely subverted because uh, buddhism and jainism were not really different you know they were just another parampara they were just another systems but they were part of the culture it's only later that they became distinct religions but they had become subverted so the the differentiation was not possible anymore so as a reason we abandoned the vedic gods and or the vedic mythology i should say and we created new mythology we created new mythology with gods who are like hinted and alluded in the vedas you know shiva rudra vishnu you know there is only once in the entire vedas the word shiva is used you know 
even though Rudra Shiva is the secret god in the Vedas and Indra, Vayu, Agni, Mitra, Varuna, they are his five aspects and his five functions. So that is the, only yogis understand that. They immediately read the text from another level and they understand that. No, but fundamentally Vishnu is a solar god of not very great prominence. Things like that. So new kind of, and old gods like Ganpati and Skanda, you know, Skartikya, Kumara, who are marginalized, they became more and more important. So it's a very fascinating process, which only again goes to show that the gods are really not that important. You know, a god is a, a deva, something that you worship, is a help is an assistance, is an aid, is a person that you acknowledge, you are stronger than me, you are more powerful, more wise than me, you have greater abilities than me, please help me also to evolve. That is what a god is. In fact, Murti Puja, the worship of images, you were supposed to, there's a whole technique, maybe someday I'll talk about it, you were supposed to internalize that entire Murti completely inside you, First you were supposed to energize the murti, so you were supposed to bring that deva, you were supposed to bring that vital being entirely into you and then let it function through you till it took you to the point after which you were supposed to take your murti and throw it into the river. Which is why even today from the rivers and all that ancient murtis keep coming up because yes. somebody did that murti sadhana and then chucked it. So your murti or your aspect of God was always regarded as a step in the way, as a help, as an aid. It was something that. Then they realized if you don't acknowledge anything superior to yourself, you are in trouble. So everybody, even in our mythology, there is Vishnu and he is doing Shiva Puja all the time. Okay. There is Shiva and he is doing Vishnu Puja all the time. He's a college so, Yes, everybody has to acknowledge something. Because even if you are Shiva or Vishnu, you are still not the ultimate Godhead. So what do you worship? So it is better to worship something divine. It is better to worship something good. But man, Manava, like I said, Manava comes from the word Manas, you know, and Manas means awareness. It also means mind. Homo sapiens sapiens, man who is aware, he is aware. That is our biological classification. So right there you have it. The animal that is aware that it is aware, because anybody who's kept pets know that animals have consciousness, they have cleverness, they, they, are, they even have awareness, you know. But are they aware that they are aware? I am not so sure about cats. I think cats are pretty, pretty aware that they are aware. <laughs> Dogs are not. <laughs> Dogs are not. So, so this notion of Manava, the person who accepts the limitation of the skin as it is called, accepts the limitation of the Mrityu Loka is the only person who can break free of karma. Otherwise, you do a lot of good karma, you get promoted, you become a god, you get worship. Once that stock of karma exhausts, Best. back here. So the Manava is the only person who can break free of the karmic cycle and become what is called a Rishi, that is a person who perceives reality directly without all the karmic and cosmic filters. A rishi means a person who can see, a person who can perceive reality directly. You know, we have the concept of maya which is mistranslated as illusion. That is not what it's saying. What it is saying is that what we see, perceptual reality is false. You know, we see a flat earth, we see a still earth. We know that is not true. Our perceptions deceive us at every moment. Conceptual reality is the truth. So the Rishi is the person who can function from the conceptual reality, the absolute truth. And what he sees is the truth. He does not see the deceptions of the world, or he does not see the, the traps of the world, or he does not see... Again, it's a, it's a skin limitation. Because of our skin limitation, we cannot push back until we discovered spaceships and we could push back and then we can actually see the planet hanging in space, yeah. and you can actually see the, you know, curvature, yeah, the, the curvature of the land and things like that. So Manava, in that sense, was always the most important thing. Manava was the most important thing for consciousness to evolve. You see, because consciousness tried multiple ways. It tried size with the dinosaurs. <coughs> didn't work. It tried beauty with the birds and the fishes and the butterflies, and that didn't work. 
it's it tried sheer power and strength you know and that didn't work so it's it's trying multiple ways to attain something so it is well known in yoga that we are a transitional species even manava is a transitional species we are heading towards something we are heading towards that purushottam certain people who are called enlightened or liberated or masters have done it before they have managed it before they can come and give us some glimpses they are the people who come and announce we are amrita saputra amrita saputra children of immortality so only as being in the human state can we move back to that god now of course the question will ask why did this happen why are human beings or they were trapped in this cycle of karma i really do not know the answer to that is once you have attained once you are liberated you know i really do not know and it's a very very complex knotty and there's really no satisfactory answer things are the way they are but there's no answer to what happens also when a deva what the deva goes out to he can either come back here and start all over again or, or he can go to another plane where he is not a deva and he can do his sadhana there he can try to become a rishi you see the devtas have too many pleasures which is why amongst all the devtas there is only one rishi and that turns out to be narad you know he <laughs> deva rishi you know human beings have more rishis rakshasas have more rishis than the devas can you imagine that because the potential to be a rishi is very strangulated when you are a deva you, know? you don't become a you don't become a and you know of course in buddhism what happened is that while they did displace the gods they immediately replaced it with buddha and the sangha you know and if you have the slightest question against the buddha and the sangha that is it you are lost forever you, know? <laughs> you cannot have a question you cannot have a question so you know again that is not freedom though yoga has always been the most free that way yoga has always been the most free that way and which is why the the person who is enlightened is what counts in the culture and whatever you do any practice that you take up any nonsense that you do if it takes you one step towards enlightenment this culture will accept this culture has this staggering tolerance of eccentricity and weirdness <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from here because i don't know it won't work for me but it might work for him which is why the the concept of shiva if you look at shiva he is such a weirdo he is a he acts strange he lives in strange environments he has strange companions he has strange behaviors and yet at the same time he is the ultimate godhead you know so the culture designed it that if you can accept shiva you can easily put up with anybody else <laughs> it was a it was a very short form of of accepting but you know we have such strange practices you know we have such strange in the used to be the ajivikas at one time very popular the initiation ceremony was to be buried up to the neck in the ground and then the your teacher or your other people would sit and pull your hair out one hair at a time <laughs> from your head <laughs> so and they were one of the very very dominant cults at the time they were they were they got a lot of grants and everything from bindusara who was the son of chandragupta maurya and father of ashoka and they had this whole peculiar philosophy which today masquerades as non dualism which is basically everything is written in stone and there's nothing you can do whatever happens happens again that is not really an indian attitude but the indian attitude believes in shrama toil effort personal effort shram. purushakara sham purushakara the thing is yes of course karma puts you into certain uh, patterns you have created a certain reality for yourself but with your effort you can break that reality and recreate a new reality so that that notion of man being the point of the cosmos that notion of yata pinde tatha brahmande which means as is inside so is the cosmos and that is only the human being it is not anybody else so the human being is the only living being that is capable of liberation the human being is the only living being that is capable of enlightenment okay enlightenment is possible even for the devas but liberation is not possible you see because the three are not the same awakening is one thing awakening is the start of the spiritual process awakening is the start of the evolutionary spiritual process that can happen even by accident 
you did enough good karma it is the time in your life you are sitting at home and you get awakened that can happen that is tamas it can happen at any any time or you went to a temple or you met a guru or you read a book or anything can awaken you awakening is tamasic there is absolutely it's below consciousness there is absolutely nothing there in of course everything is in conscious but it's a subconscious process attaining is a rajasic process you got to do sadhana you got to do <laughs> you got to do toil you got to do many many processes liberation unfortunately happens only through grace <laughs> either the guru or a deva or some circumstance to be pushed over that final boundary no matter what you do that is grace it's very unfair but you know that's the way that's it is that is a satvik process so it has to be earned so this people are not normally and for most people the moment of liberation is also the moment of death because the infusion of energy that happens at the moment of liberation is so super colossal that a normal body cannot tolerate so you just drop the the body and go but you know of course all this is predicated on the acceptance of the notion of karma but you know yogis always experience it they always experience the memories of past life so karma was never seriously challenged in india it was just the bedrock of the culture other people have big issues with the notion of karma but you know if you do any kind of serious meditation within time you start see how it happened from mineral to plant to animal to human and before you come to animal to human you always last animal birth is cow which is the reason the cow is not to be slaughtered because you are you are stopping a very vital push forward in evolution the yogis know that the last animal birth is always that of a cow not a dog or an elephant or a tiger or whatever it's always a cow so that is the reason why cows are not to be slaughtered that is a yogic reason other than all the socio cultural reasons the yogi reason is the last birth is always that of a cow the cow is a potential human being but yes after that don't continue to live like a cow live like a manava yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know so being born human is therefore regarded as the greatest blessing being born human is therefore regarded as the greatest thing you can hope for and pray for and of course we only complain about it you know but the truth of the matter is in the culture we are more important than the gods and there is no culture in the world where this can be said with any truth in every other culture the human being was sacrificed for the gods yes this is totally different this is totally different we are more important than the gods it does not matter if the devas are wiped out tomorrow but if manavas are wiped out it's a big catastrophe for consciousness i am saying that very very clearly you know so the responsibility that you have to participate in your evolution becomes very great because this is a chance you have been given health you have been given intelligence you have been given access to these things so everybody has a very serious spiritual responsibility that is what the culture says now of course we are broken from our culture so it's okay <laughs> but the fact of the matter is the responsibility to consciously speed up your evolution is very great but this is a rare chance this is a rare chance but evolution is also happening in the other 24 years in the last years right? to live there uh, yeah but they are happening very very slow speed it's it happens in this mind bogglingly there are advantages you don't karma doesn't stick to you so easily but the disadvantage is this if you want to burn up because see we are all enlightened what is the problem and the problem is the mountain load of karma karma, karma. and all sadhana is just to dissolve that at karma so that is where the human being and the human being has that potential to grow to something else the human being has the potential in the human body they become greater than the gods they become rishis you know they they so what do you have to do to become a rishi now? you just got to be like vishamitra you got to be stubborn about the matter you know <laughs> <laughs> so rishis are enlightened or liberated both rishis are both liberated and the both the buddhas are liberated and enlightened and enlightened and the tirthankaras are they're all they're all they all rishis basically they all rishis. rishis they all rishis they all rishis it's very rare but normally the moment of liberation you drop the body it's very difficult it's very difficult to hold it in place bodhisattvas 
they are buddhas in training no right they are buddhas in training they are Bud- they are people with the potential to become buddhas so, inter so they have attained they have attained they have not they have attained you see you can attain many many levels of consciousness many magnificent levels of consciousness and you can do a lot of grand and wonderful stuff but that still doesn't mean you're liberated so it's a big problem now how do you know yes there is a problem because everybody is convinced that my teacher at least is both enlightened and liberated <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily so there's a problem there but in terms of how important the man is you know this and it's so sad you know that we have forgotten this about our culture the centrality of the human being because now unfortunately we sacrifice the human being to society to family to caste group to language group you know the human being is not the only place a person can be free is if he puts a langot and runs away to the himalayas you know which is fundamentally the reason why they went to the himalayas just to get away from the society and the culture it's very very tragic it's very tragic but in psychological terms this is unique i have not seen a single culture like this i have not seen a single culture like this where man is the central aspect and we don't realize it we don't realize what an awesome thing that is and what a what courage our rishis had to just state that fact you know amrita saputra we are the children of immortality you are only devas <laughs> <laughs> it is awesome awesome thing and we don't we don't act like that we don't act from that consciousness we don't act from that consciousness that our responsibility is greater than that even of the devas because deva is a, you know he is a contract guy basically once his karma runs out demotion <laughs> next person up or even some asura is there he can't wait he like you get out i i i am more deserving of this position so if you want you can do that you can actually develop that asura prakriti and say okay i want to be indra i want to enjoy you know all that kind of but that is uh, that the famous joke about that guy who started doing sadhana and started doing tapasya sorry now in kali yuga that is current not current because the kali yuga is over but you know he started doing tapasya in kali yuga you are not supposed to do tapasya it was contraindicated so the gods got really worried and so since he worship krishna krishna manifested you know why is this guy doing tapasya you know, that's not what is recommended so krishna manifests you know krishna bhagwan aap hai wo minka wala scene kidhar gaya so so you know the reason why you do something also if you are operating from that unawareness if you are operating from that lower quality thing when you are operating from that desire see desires people keep saying you know finish your desires i mean actually they should be saying don't add don't multiply your desires because the desires that you have you have <laughs> you need to exhaust them don't keep adding don't keep salivating when you see the lamborghini or katrina yes. care you know that's <laughs> but desires will be there you will have. you have to finish them there is no way around it there is no way around it some lifetime you have to finish it so The, the correct thing that the people should be told is not don't have desires which is a cruel and inhuman thing to say yeah. the correct thing is don't add to your desires you, know, you have these desires work them out and don't add to them but then again our culture is so fractured unfortunately you know because a lot of the texts are lost a lot of the lineages are lost and now we are all trying to rebuild all of them very slowly and carefully And especially the inner things all the inner stuff is to the point of extinction it's this sad state of affairs but then there's a lot of hope also because a lot of stuff that used to be secret is now coming out into the public domain so i will certainly not lose hope but still more can be done more is expected more should be expected because we are manavas we are more important than the gods